great to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of my family, I just want to say a huge thank you uh, for those of you who've been praying for us. Uh, if you follow us on social media, know it was a pretty rough week in our family. Um, just keep, keep us in your prayers. It's, you know, still a pretty rough week. And uh, I know my, my dad in Toronto would appreciate your prayers and my fam- extended family, if you could be praying for us. It's just been a really tough week. So um, if the sermon comes out really angry, that's why, okay? (laughs) Make excuses at the beginning. Uh, Just a quick little announcement before we dive into today's message. Um, If you get our regular email that goes out on Friday, you would have received a digital copy of our ministry annual report. This kind of gives a snapshot of everything that kind of went on here in our church family this past year. It also has all the financial information that we will be voting on as a church family next Sunday evening, not tonight, next week in our annual general meeting. So um, if you don't get the weekly email or if you want a digital copy of this in the connection card in the chair in front of you, just make sure that your email address is spelled legibly. We've had a few people fill out the card. I type in what I think you wrote and it bounces back saying it's an invalid email address. So if you filled out a card and you're not getting the email address, I'm assuming you're a doctor, okay? Because your handwriting's terrible. Print in block letters slowly and we'll make sure that you get that information. Uh, We do have a few paper copies available, especially if you maybe you're new to us as a church and you're kind of just praying and considering and whether God's calling you to become a part of our family here. This is a great way to try to get a good snapshot of all that God is doing. I encourage you to grab a copy of that. And next week, uh, for the members who can't attend the meeting, so this is just for the members who can't attend the meeting, if I have approved your reason why you can't attend the meeting, (laughs) you caught that? If I have approved the reason, anyway, that's a bad joke, I still need you to vote. If you can't attend the meeting as a nonprofit organization in Canada, there's certain laws and certain guidelines. We need quorum and all of this fun hoopla that's part of just life in Canada. We need your vote. So we actually have proxy forms in the back. The ushers have a copy of it. If you only if only if you're a member and only if you can't make it next Sunday. You need to grab one of these. You need to fill it out. Again, legibly, I do need your name on it. It's not a private vote. I need your name because I have to count you against our membership list for quorum and things like that. So you can grab a copy of that and you give that to me. Not an usher, not the offering plate, to me. So I can make sure that that is dealt with to the letter of the law of the land. Okay, so we've dealt with the business side of things. Let's get into the Bible side of things. We are in week four of our sermon series called 10. We are looking at the 10 commandments. And what I love about this series is sometimes we look at very familiar texts in the Bible. Sometimes these texts become so familiar that we actually begin as Christians to forget the power that's in this text, to forget what God originally intended this text to mean and how Regardless of when the church reads this, it is still relevant for our culture and our times today. So we kicked this series off. We talked about the first two commandments, which are, you'll have no other God before me and you won't have an idol. Because here's the problem. Every single one of us, all of us, every human being that has ever walked the face of the planet has an idol problem. We are quick to fix our hearts to something other than God. It was the problem in the Garden of Eden. It was the problem in Egypt. It was the problem in the wilderness. It was the problem in Jesus's day. And it's our problem still today. (laughs) And we saw that no commandment, no rule, no tradition, no church governance can free us from that. It is only Jesus who can give us a new heart. So we saw in the first week that we have to be, you know, putting things before God is a human problem that Jesus came to deal with. We also saw in week two, how we are to honor the name of God. Now, this isn't simply about swearing and using the Lord's name in vain, but God's name is who he is. It's his character. It's his nature. And how you and I live our lives can either bring honor or dishonor to the character of God. So we have to be mindful of that. 
And we talked about how we also live out lives of honoring our parents. Last week, we talked about Sabbath, about spiritual rest for our souls. That it is a free gift. God has given you permission and freedom to meet with him. And you have the choice to accept it or not. (laughs) To run ragged or meet with God. All right. And so we saw the in huge importance of Sabbath keeping in our very, very busy culture today. So today we're going to continue. We're looking at commandment number six and commandment number seven. These are short. They're fast. By the time I read them, you will not have even opened your Bible yet. Okay. But if you want to open your Bible, you can see if you can beat me and get there. It's Exodus chapter 20. I'm reading in verse 13. Commandment number six, commandment number seven, Real simple, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. And I'm done. Nine words. <laughs> you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Back in Moses' day, God's desire for the people of Israel was to not kill anybody. God's desire for the people of Israel was to not sleep around. God's desire for the church today is not to kill anyone and not to sleep around. That's all I got for today. So I'm going to call Paul and the worship team back up. They're going to lead us in a few songs. Hopefully this was clear. I don't know how to make this any clearer than this. Stop killing people. Stop sleeping around. (laughs) It's really easy. (sighs) Okay, so we can laugh and we can joke about it, but if we look at these two commandments, commandment number six and commandment number seven, from a legalistic law perspective, I think most of us could say, woohoo, I'm okay on these ones. Okay, I maybe broke the other eight, but I'm fine with these two, right? Well, we have to look at these a little deeper than just these simple nine words. Why is God even concerned with this? Why are these even written down? Aren't these no-brainers? Like, no one had to teach me not to kill somebody. I just kind of known that that's bad, (laughs) right? I kind of just known, you know, adultery. If I start sleeping around, my wife's not going to like that. And it's going to come back and bite me in the butt. It's kind of just a natural thing, right? Why does God even have to say these words? Well, the reason God has to say these words is because remember what God is doing by giving the Ten Commandments. He is setting a group of people to look radically different than the entire culture around them. That is what God is doing. He is setting a group of people, his chosen people, to look and to live and to behave and to worship and to believe very, very different than everybody else. See, so back in Moses' day, when you hear the word murder, right, the Hebrew word that is used here is the Hebrew word tirsach. And this word means the unlawful killing of an innocent person. Murder is the unlawful killing of an innocent person. When this word is used repeatedly in the Old Testament, it's always about the innocent being destroyed. There's even a proverb, I think it's uh, Proverb 22, verse 13, somewhere around there, where it talks about the person being killed by a lion. That word being killed by a lion is being murdered by the lion. The person was innocent and the lion comes and devours them. Murder is about the unlawful taking of innocent life. And and I realize in the day and the age that we live in, when we talk about this kind of commandment, this murder, I could do a three-week sermon series just on this one verse because it brings up a whole lot of theological questions, right? Well, what about capital punishment? What about war? Should Christians be pacifists? What do we do with the fact that God himself kills people? (laughs) 
What do we do with the fact that God sends angels and wipes out whole cities? What do we do with God calling his people to go in and cleanse the land and get rid of everybody, right? That's a whole other theological conversation to have. Big topic. But when God says these four simple words, you shall not murder, God is talking about protecting the innocence of human life out of reverence for God. And the reason why God has to say this is because the culture of Moses was people didn't regard human life as something to be protected. (laughs) It was the strong survive, survival of the fittest. If you couldn't survive, you were killed, you were destroyed, people would just take. (laughs) And those are other commandments that are coming later on. (laughs) There's no regard for human life. And so God reminds them of the importance of humanity murdering, killing the unlawful taking of innocent life. The next verse, when it talks about adultery, again, this is a whole other topic again too. What is being talked about here? There's so much on the topic of sexual ethics, sexual purity, you know, sexual sin. What is sin? What is not sin? Where is the boundaries? All of these different things. What does adultery mean even? Well, again, in this context, in this verse, what adultery means, it's a married person having consensual, mutually agreed upon sex with someone else, not their spouse. Kind of a simple definition. (laughs) It's what it means. It's a married person choosing to have mutually agreed upon mutual consent sex with someone else, not their spouse. Right? This isn't about polygamy and the fact that these people had a whole bunch of wives. This isn't about rape. This isn't about things like that. This is, this is what's really being spoken about when it comes to adultery. And God is showing in these two very simple verses that he is speaking very countercultural to the world and the cultures and the beliefs that would have been in Moses' day. You see, back in Moses' day, there is no high regard for human life. It's disposable. There's no regard for marriage. It's disposable. Like when you actually read God's commandments for marriage, God is setting up all of these guidelines and all of these rails. I talked to kind of atheist people, non-Christian people, and they go, oh my goodness, the Bible hates women and it's so, you know, anti-women. I'm like, have you read it? And have you read it in the context of the culture that it comes from? It's the most progressive book ever written. The fact that people had to treat their wives well, that God gave commandments on how to protect women, to how to divorce them properly. You couldn't just throw them away. See, the culture that Moses comes from is, my wife's getting a little old and run down now. This 16-year-old's fine. I'm going to go over there. Right? And God's saying, you're not allowed to treat your daughters like this. It's radically different than any other culture. Incredibly progressive when we understand it in the context that it was written in. The huge value of human life, the huge value on marriage and protecting the sanctity of marriage. Right? This is what these two commandments are hitting on in Moses' day. And so in order to kind of, I mean, because it's only nine words, so it's hard to unpack it any deeper than that with just these nine words. So we're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter five, because Jesus teaches on these two commandments in Matthew chapter five, verse 21 to 30, if you want to open there. Now, before I read that text, I want to ask you a question just to kind of set our mindset around what we're about to look at. And the question I want you to ask, and I want you to shout out your answer. Do you truly believe God wants what's best for you? Yeah. Yeah. Heads are nodding. People are going, yeah, preach. I truly want what God wants. I I truly believe God wants what's best for me. Now, I'm going to be honest. This is a loaded question. And the reason it's a loaded question is my follow-up. Then why don't you live like it? See, this is the challenge that Jesus is about to address. 
to religious people who believe God wants the best for them. This is the challenge for me as a pastor, as a man of God, as someone who loves my wife and loves my family, loves the Lord. If we truly believe that God wants what's best for us, the follow-up question is we all have to ask ourselves, then why do I live in such a way that it appears like I don't believe this? This is what Jesus is about to hit on. So these are Jesus' words, not Kevin's. Let's read from Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start reading here in verse 21. Jesus is giving what is known in religious circles as the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' most famous sermon. Context-wise, important to understand is Jesus is speaking to followers, speaking to his disciples, people who are following him. Jesus in the crowd. Jesus is also speaking to people who are curious about Jesus and who he is. And in the crowd, there are also enemies of his, religious leaders who want him dead for doing things like healing on the Sabbath, like we saw last week, (laughs) disrupting the system, (laughs) upsetting the religious people. (laughs) So three groups of people are hearing this, the faithful, the followers, the curious, and the enemy. So Jesus preaches this message and he says this, This is what Matthew records for us in verse 21. It says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. When? Ten commandments. Long time ago. You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Ooh, wait a second. Murder. I didn't kill anyone. Anger? Eh, Maybe. Again, he goes on. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, it's a good Aramaic word. I've never called anyone that. I'm good. (laughs) Okay, Raka is Aramaic for idiot. Oh, snap. I've used that one. Okay. (laughs) If you call a brother or a sister an idiot, you are answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, are in dangers of the fire of, of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go, be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. (laughs) See, nine little words. (laughs) Nine simple, little, tiny words that we can go in our religious laws and our religious traditions go, I'm good. I didn't do it. (laughs) And then Jesus unpacks the nine words. (laughs) Because what is Jesus trying to do? Jesus is trying to get into our hearts. He's addressing the heart issue, not the letter of the law issue. You see, when you and I become obsessed with the letter of the law, what we do is we basically create a fence and we figure out where can I play? And when you and I build a fence, we tend to play on the fence, Years ago, when my kids were little, we'd go camping. We still go camping every summer. I hate it. But I love my family, and I love hanging out with my in-laws. And so I put on a smile on my face, and I sit out in the rain and the cold, and I sleep on the ground because I love my family. Okay? One of the things that I don't like about camping is swimming. I am afraid of the water. I have tried to get over it. 
I almost drowned once when I was a little kid. My grandfather had to pull me out of a lake. I almost drowned again as a teenager when I went whitewater rafting. I don't like the water. It makes me nervous. I get uncomfortable around it. And I get even more uncomfortable around the water when I see people being stupid in the water. I'm not allowed to say stupid. I had a little kid once say, Pastor Kevin said stupid. <laughs> I shouldn't say stupid. Okay, anyways, when you're being a fool or when you're being a raka in the water, okay, I don't like it. It makes me nervous, right? So what I did when my kids were little in order to not, honestly, it wasn't about their protection. It was about my pleasure. If I'm going to have fun on this beach, you must obey me. So I set up the rules. Here's the line. If you cross the line, your father will become angry with you. And then his wrath will come and pull you out of the water. See, that's what Jesus is addressing. You see, when we create the boundaries in order to please father, what we tend to do, exactly like what my kids did when they were little, the rule was that line of floaties, don't cross it. Because on the other side of the floaties, you got all these drunk people driving their boats, like madmen, and they're jet skiing and water skiing. And like, I don't know if they can see a little kid in the water. Like you're not allowed to cross the line. I remember I even had that rule for Danielle when we started dating. We started dating. See, the Danielle, just don't swim past the line. She looked at me, oh yeah, swim clear across the lake. It's like, you kidding me? Okay, that rebellious nature is in all of us, right? So when you give people the rule, don't cross the line. Where, do, where did my kids play? On the line. They're riding the line. They're sitting on the rope and they're sitting on the floaty and like, hi, dad, haven't crossed the line, dad. And then what happens? They fall. Which way do they fall? On the safe side or on the not safe side? always on the non-safe side. I have come to believe, this is a spiritual principle that I believe to my core is true. When Christians spend their entire lives on the line, you will always fall off of it in the wrong way. Every time. It is a statistical certainty. When Christians live their lives on the line, you will always cross it. I've never met a Christian who's living their faith on one of these lines and their faith is vibrant and growing and they're reaching people and God is using them in mighty ways because they're too busy playing the line. Just too busy hovering around the line. What am I going to get caught? When, am I get, when are people going to find out? <laughs> See, so Jesus in this text, this is what he's getting at when he's speaking to these religious leaders, because they're all about building the line. Let's hover around the line so we don't make father angry. And Jesus is like, no, you need to look at the heart. Because just like in Moses's day, the people of Israel were called to live lives that were set apart, to look different than the culture around them. Just like today, the church is called to live lives that look different than the rest of culture. So what is some of the things that Jesus is unpacking here, right? So Jesus is talking about this whole idea of murder. He says, don't think about it as the innocent killing of someone. Is, are you mad at somebody? Oops. And not mad at non-Christians. This is not an outside the church world thing. This is an inside the church thing. This is against brother and sister. Are you mad at someone? Jesus says you have a heart problem. Have you called someone a fool? Jesus says you have a heart problem. Have you called someone an idiot? Jesus says you have a heart problem. And if you have that kind of a heart problem, be careful. Because you're in trouble. You're in danger. You're letting something into your life that shouldn't be there. Like if Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your second is just as important, love your neighbor as yourself, but we're angry with brothers and sisters, we, call, we think they're idiots, we think they're fools, we're in trouble. <laughs> right? It's the same thing with about adultery. 
when Jesus is talking about, man, what are you letting into your life? It's not the fact that you never slept with the person. It's the fact that you're letting thoughts get into your mind. You're already in trouble. You're already on a slippery slope. You've already committed adultery just by thinking lustfully about someone who's not your spouse. What have you let into your heart? You see, Jesus is addressing these two big issues that we saw at the beginning in, what, in the Ten Commandments. It's the nature of humanity, the innocent life. You see, you are created in the image and likeness of God. You are not an evolved monkey. One of my favorite comic books growing up had this character from another planet who called humanity hairless apes. You are not a hairless ape. You are created in the image and likeness of a holy, righteous, loving God. You're not an accident. There wasn't a pond of scum that got hit by lightning and the cells started to divide. You are created in the image and likeness of God. That is why humanity is set apart from every other living thing in the world. That doesn't mean don't be a good steward and that doesn't mean don't love the dolphins and get rid of straws to protect the baby turtles. I'm working on it, Sam. She's always like, dad, you're using a straw, baby turtles. Okay, forgot. Okay, be a good steward, all of that thing. But humanity is higher than everything else because we're image bearers of God. And Jesus is reminding people of that, how we treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Same thing as marriage. That marriage is something that is holy. Marriage is something that is set apart. Marriage is something that looks different than every other human relationship. You see, Jesus doesn't really care what culture thinks of marriage. The church should not care what culture thinks of marriage. It's Call, call these relationships outside the church whatever you want. I don't, I'm not concerned with that. But it's not marriage, according to God. He's got a different working definition. It's separate. It's set apart. It's holier than any other human relationship, right? And so this is what Jesus is drawing to. So we have to be mindful of these two things. And so when on the topic of adultery... Because marriage is something different, God describes his relationship with his people as marriage. We're the bride. The dudes go, what? Okay. We're the bride. I know, guys, it's hard to... Don't picture me in a wedding dress. Don't go there. Okay. But we're the bride. Jesus is the groom. That's the language God uses. Ezekiel chapter 6. When God's heart is breaking, he calls the people of Israel when they wander to other gods, when they worship other gods, God calls them adulterers. That they're cheating on him. That they're having sex with other gods. They've given their heart to someone else. Right? And so these are the attitudes that Jesus is addressing in this teaching. Right, so kind of the big idea that I want you to remember as we finish this message today is how we treat each other matters greatly to God. How the church treats each other matters greatly to God. The reason why I asked you, do you truly believe God wants what's best for you? <laughs> It has to do how we live out this church thing. <laughs> and sadly, I think a lot of the times the church in Canada, I, I think we're, we're missing something. That we're not treating each other very well. <laughs> and it matters to God. You see, Jesus said these very famous words. He says, the people out there, the people who don't believe in God, people who are living lives very different from the ways of God, the people out there, they will know that you are followers of Jesus when you get your doctrine straight and you have your theology perfect and you correct all the stupid people around you. Then the world will know that you're my followers. Obviously, we all chuckle and go, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, the world will know we are followers of Jesus by our love for one another. The messiness of it, the complexity of it, how we treat each other matters greatly to God. And I could sit here 
and I could give you a list. Here's 10 ways that you could treat people better in the church. Or I could give you a list of here's 10 ways that you could guard your marriage. <laughs> but then I would just be building another fence. <laughs> Right? And I gotta, now I got to keep this fence that Pastor Kevin gave me. Well, the reality is that these commandments are unkeepable unless you have a changed heart. <laughs> you see, it's not the law, it's not the commandment that's going to help you to honor people well. It's not the law, it's not the commandment that's going to guard your marriage. <laughs> it's a new heart. <laughs> And the Bible actually teaches us that it's actually really easy to get one of those. See, it's not about just simply saying, I believe in Jesus, right? You can sit there, you can go to church your whole life. You can sit there and say, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. You can say, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. I believe Jesus is going to come and judge the living and the dead. You can say, I believe all those things. The Bible teaches, guess what? Satan believes those things too. The demons believe those things too. It's not about belief. It's about repentance. It's to say, my heart loves murder. My heart loves adultery. And I need to turn that heart away from those things and turn it back to God. And Paul says, when you do that, it's a simple thing going where you say, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. I believe Jesus died for my debt, my, my sin. I believe you offer me a new heart. Today I give it to you. Help me to turn from these desires and constantly turn to you. Paul says when you do that, you get a new heart. And it's out of that new heart that we learn to deal with the teaching of Jesus here. So I'm going to assume, before I give you these three things to consider, that you've made that choice. If you're here today, and I don't want you to feel pressure to make that choice, I don't want you to feel pressure to commit to something you're not ready to do, that's amazing that you're here. I would just ask that you contemplate this. I'm not giving a checklist for you if you still haven't figured out that Jesus thing. But for those of us who have made that choice to surrender our hearts to Christ then there's three things I think Jesus gets at in his teaching. And they're not a checklist. They're conversations we have to have. They're questions that we have to ask ourselves. The first question that we each need to ask ourselves, how can commandment number six and number seven play out in our lives? Well, the first question we have to ask is, um, how do we talk about each other? How do we talk about each other? I mean, you may not be saying raka to people, but do your minds kind of think, some people in the church are idiots or they're fools. How's your heart when you leave on a Sunday morning? Man, that pastor preached awful long. What an idiot. Pastor Kevin didn't understand that text the way I understand that text. What a fool. Or he didn't like this, or I didn't like my small group leader, or I didn't like my elder, or I didn't like, I didn't like. How's our hearts? How are we talking about one another? I remember when I was still a fairly new Christian, I was attending our church in Montreal, and I loved that church. I loved that church dearly. dearly. My wife became a Christian in that church. Both of my kids were dedicated in that church. We recommitted our, our marriage vows to one another in that church. I loved that church. One day, the elders made a decision, and I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. These guys are morons. I can't believe that they would make that kind of a decision in our church. And I figured, yeah, and it's my duty to let other people know that I think they're morons for making that decision. Because I was right. And a mentor of mine took me aside, saw some of the attitude that was starting to grow in my life. And he said, Kevin, you know what? You are right. What you are saying is right. But you're wrong. Because the way you're speaking about these men of God, the way that you're speaking about these elders is wrong. And I had to do some major heart work on that. You see, Jesus is very concerned with how we are talking about each other. See, we have more access to information now than any other point in human history. We, see, back in my grandparents' day, 
You didn't know what the church across the street believed because you didn't attend it. Now we know because of social media. And the number of Christians that are so quick to post articles slamming other churches, slamming other ministers, slamming other works of God, because I don't like it. Now, if they're unbiblical and they're preaching a message that is other than Jesus is the only way to God, absolutely, you need to call that out absolutely every time. But we have to understand that there are basically seven key things that makes a church Christian. Jesus is the only way to God. There's one God, creator of heaven and earth. He's a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus paid the price for our sin, to pay something that we couldn't pay. He physically died, physically rose again, physically ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God and he sent the Holy Spirit in you and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. You believe that? You're Christian. Everything else is what Augustine called secondary. And in the secondary things, there is liberty and should be charity. <laughs> we kind of forget the charity part. How are you talking about other people? It matters to God. It's the first thing. We all have to ask ourselves that. The second thing that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we reconcile with others? This is one of the major differences that Jesus is highlighting. Right? He's leading Christians to look at what reconciliation means. How do we reconcile broken relationships? How do we reconcile broken marriages? How do we reconcile broken friendships? This is, <laughs> it's funny about this. When you study this in the Jewish context of Jesus's day, this is more important to Jesus than the sacrificial offering system in the temple. Think about that for a moment. See, we sit there and say, oh, you know, we got to reconcile, you know, before I take communion. Yeah, we don't make a big deal out of it. But in, Ju Ju in ancient Judaism, you see, this farmer would bring his sheep to the temple so that the priest would sacrifice the temple, split, you know, put the blood of the sheep on the altar so that his sin would be atoned for. This is kind of the whole heart of Judaism. And Jesus is saying, your reconciliation with your brother or sister is more important than your sin reconciliation. Oh my goodness, can you imagine how many people he freaked out with this statement? Because that's the heart of the matter. Not about being so religious that you kept all the religious traditions, but your heart is wrong. Jesus says, you, we need to be quick to heal relationships. We need to be quick to apologize. And I've worked on this hard. I try to keep my list real short. You know, this story with my elders in my church years ago, I actually made the decision when my mentor had said, dude, you're wrong. Like your attitude is wrong. There's something wrong with your heart. I actually made the decision to not take communion until I could sit down and meet with the elders that I needed to repent. I needed to apologize. I didn't need to call them out and correct them. I, my heart was wrong. And so I didn't take communion. I was, and I remember this as clear as day. It was hilarious. I'm sitting in the very, very back row and God was working on my heart. And I'm one of those crying worship people. Like the song, I cry in worship. It's just how I, wo I roll. So I'm in the back row and I'm crying and the communion plate goes by and it goes, I don't take it. And one of my best friends was one of the ushers that Sunday. So he's having a panic attack. Kevin's crying. He's not taking communion. His wife is not sitting beside him. Where is she? Oh my God, Kevin left his wife. Everyone's in a panic. <laughs> Okay, so I get out of church. Danielle was volunteering in the nursery that Sunday, okay? She didn't leave me. Um, but anyways, I get out of the sanctuary and literally in the foyer, all the elders are waiting for me. They want to know if I'm okay. Is everything wrong? And I'm like, dude, I've been waiting for two months to book a meeting with you guys to say I'm sorry. So I said sorry right there in the foyer. And then we took some of the bread out of the garbage and we had communion together. <laughs> It wasn't quite in the garbage yet, but it was on its way, okay? It's still holy bread, okay? We have to be so quick to reconcile. See, and here's the challenge in the church today. You don't have to. It's so easy to walk away and go to another church. You can be mad at me and walk, walk away. You can be mad at our elders and walk away. It's so easy 
to walk away from the church because there's a church on every corner. You see, in Ephesus, it was a little harder to walk away because they're the only Christians in the city. There's nowhere else to go. Like when you're in the city of Rome as a Christian, you better like each other because you're all going to be fed to the lions together. <laughs> okay? You had to reconcile. Today, it's too easy. I actually said this a couple of years ago, and I believe this to my core. Greenbelt is way too easy to leave. We don't run after people. We don't pursue them. We don't find out what's going on. So easy to leave here. So two years ago, I didn't make a covenant because covenants are dangerous, but I made a promise to myself that I will do everything that I can do. And when I find out someone has left, I'll meet. I meet with people and I have uncomfortable conversations, messy conversations, and I let people pour out why they're mad at me and what they hate about what I'm doing in my leadership. And I take it and I cry and I wish them well. I can't let anything be between me and them. I can't change their heart. I can only work on mine. And again, I'm not saying this as the hero. I'm saying this as a pastor who thinks this is incredibly important. It's too easy to not reconcile with one another. We have to. It's important to Jesus. It should be important to us. And then the final thing quickly is we talk about how we have to talk, how we talk about each other. We got to check our hearts on that. We got to check our hearts on how we reconcile with one another. And we got to check our hearts on how we build each other up. Right? Jesus' example about gouging out our eyes and cutting off our hands, that's not the biblical model for um, discipleship. <laughs> if that was the biblical model for discipleship, all of us would be blind and everyone would have the nickname Stumpy. <laughs> Sorry if that joke offended you, okay? But that's the reality. We've all broken these. All of us. We'd all be blind. We'd all be stumps, okay? And so this isn't the model of discipleship. It's the heart behind discipleship that we love each other so much that I'm going to step out of my comfort to talk to you in love, in mercy, with gentleness, all the things the Bible teaches, how we do correction. <laughs> Not as this holy man whose life is perfect and you're a mess. No, I am a fellow person whose life is a mess <laughs> as well. And because I love you, I'm going to have the awkward conversation with you. See, that's why we want everybody in a life group. So that someone knows what's going on in your life. Three services, two in English, one in Arabic. I can't know what's going on in everybody's life. You need someone closer than me to speak into your life, to correct each other, right? To spur each other on, right? So this is what we have to look at because how we treat each other is incredibly important to God. It matters to God, so it should matter to us, <laughs> Again, commandment number six, commandment number seven sounds so easy. <laughs> they sound so easy, but it takes huge heart work <laughs> to let the Spirit of God work in us and work through us to transform us in this way. And I believe the church that gets this right is the church that God is going to use in ways they couldn't even ask or imagine <laughs> because it's about people, <laughs> people that God loves people that Jesus died for, people that need to be a part of the family of God, to experience a level of love that the world does not offer. <laughs> you see, the world that we live in today offers condemnation and judgment. The world today that we live in, the culture we live in today is a victim culture. <laughs> we don't offer grace to people. We offer condemnation to people. See, humanity is the worst to try to figure out judgment. Because if I do something wrong, I have reasons. There's valid reasons why I did this. If you do something wrong, it's because you're a horrible human being. <laughs> it's how it works. <laughs> we need a new heart to free us from that. To love people the way Jesus loves. To roll up our sleeves and allow ministry to be a little messier than we'd like. <laughs> to create some margin in our lives so that we can have these conversations about how we talk about each other, how we reconcile with each other, and how we build each other up. 
See, when we live like that, that's the kind of church that changes the world. That's what Jesus wants to do through these commandments. So let's pray. Father God, I praise you. I thank you for the reminders even this week where I have fallen short on this. Where I've thought of people, brothers and sisters, as fools for not doing church the way I think church should be done, not believing the way I think they should believe. So God, forgive me. Father, we live in a culture today where we don't even need to go searching for lust. Lust lust comes looking for us. It's very easy to let things get into our minds and to our hearts. So God, guard our hearts. Keep our minds pure. But above all things, God, I pray that you would work in all of us. That whatever these questions bring out, if you're bringing to mind someone that we've not spoken of well, Forgive us for that. Help us to quickly reconcile there and to heal that relationship as much as that is humanly possible. (laughs) Father, help us to be men, women, boys, and girls that encourage and build each other up for your glory. How we treat each other matters greatly to God. So I'm just going to give a moment (laughs) If you have something that you need to just confess before God, you don't have to shout this out. This is this is private. This is between you and God. These are holy moments to meet with God, to ask for forgiveness, to ask for a step that you need to take so that you could treat your relationships with others and sisters in Christ with the same level of regard that Jesus calls us to. Let's just take a moment. So Lord God, I praise you for the work that you are doing in this place today, the work that you're doing online. And God, man, when we confess our sins in this way, this is not a guilt trip. This sets us free. It takes the burden off of our hearts. It actually lifts us up and it's supposed to make us feel better. So God, as we've confessed our sin and trusted you with it, we now rejoice and we praise you, God, for what you have done that Jesus would die for us, that he would send the Holy Spirit to make us new, that you forgive all of our sins and help us to live in your power for your glory. So as we worship, just help us to rejoice in your presence. Child of God, how we treat each other matters greatly to God. How we speak about each other, how we reconcile with each other, how we build one another up, to send us out for his glory. If you're here today and you'd like someone to pray for you, prayer room over there on the left, online, send us a direct message. We'll be praying for you that way. But I pray that you would go equipped and encouraged in the power of God this week to live out commandment six and seven, wherever God sends you. If you're new with us, come in the cafe after and say hi. I would love to meet you. Everyone else have a great week. God bless. 